Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We'll call this meeting to order. Uh, first order of business is uh, disclosure of pecuniary interest and general nature thereof. Mark, you have one. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I got two, the Glinsky drain and the quarter revision for the Tate drain. Okay, thank you. And Chess? Uh, item D1, the Glinsky drain, as we want to see the and the Tate drain branch Oh, sorry, Mike. I'm sorry. And the Tate drain branches, uh, branch E, resolution 4567. Okay, thank you, Chess. So noted. The minutes uh, from June 2nd, any errors or omissions? So and then move in second over those minutes then. Moore and, and uh, Cerna, all in favor? Carried. All right, Jess, we're gonna move into the Glinsky drain. Okay, this is the uh, Glinsky drain. So George, can you give us uh, an overview of the uh, proposed work? Uh, yes, thank you, Your Worship and members of council. Can you hear me all right? We're, we're good. Excellent, thank you. So um, the Glinsky drain uh, was a section four request, a uh, petition drain to uh, provide a new drain to um, provide a legal outlet for proposed severances. I would believe it was a condition of severance. Um, there is uh, approximately three lots, or I believe there is three lots for being proposed on Kelton Line just east of Mount Salem. Um, and this will provide legal outlet to those. It has been designed to an agricultural standard, which is the standard of the downstream drain. Um, it's been designed to the same standard. Um, it includes uh, a, a small branch and a short length of main drain, um, which is a 200 millimeter pipe or an eight inch pipe. Um, it has an estimated cost of 35,600 um, and it's being assessed to the proponent of this project. And we note that this is not eligible for provincial grant as it is not an agricultural um, municipal drain. Um, and I would um, welcome any questions in regards to this project. Okay, thank you, George. Allison, has anyone submitted comments in, in, uh, in this drainage report? Through your worship, we have received no comments for this report. Okay. Any questions of council on this report? None. I don't think there's anyone else that's involved in this that has to report. So, uh, George, can you give us the next steps in the process, please? Uh, absolutely. Um, after this meeting, the council should hold a quarter revision for this project, um, noting that there is one owner being assessed for this. Um, if the council wishes, um, they could make an exception and pass without quarter revision um, if, uh, if they desire, um, because there was no opportunity for anyone else to appeal. Um, also, um, they could proceed to tendering on this project, but if the municipality wishes, since it is a single, single um, payer project, if the owner wishes to hire their own contractor, um, if that is satisfactory to the municipality, that route may be pursued as well. Okay, thank you, George. Any thank other you. questions for council before we move on? Mover and second, the engineer's report for the Glinsky drain prepared by Spreets Associated London Limited uh, dated April 26, 2022 be accepted. Bylaw number 22-44 being bylaw to provide for the Glinsky drain. Drainage work be read a first and second time and provisionally adopted. Uh, Lewis and in Cerna, all in favor? Sorry. And finally, mover and second of the quarter revision for the Glinsky drain be scheduled for to be held on July 7th at 7.30. Jagir and Lewis, all in favor? Next, we have a quarter revision for the Tate drain. So I need a mover and second of the council of the Township of Malahide does hereby appoint the following members to sit on the quarter revision for the Tate drain branch E2021. Mayor Dave Bennell, chair, Deputy Mayor Dominique Jaguer and Councillor Scott Lewis. So anybody can, can support this, but then 
Lewis and, and uh, Cerna, or Cerna and Moore, all in favor? Carried. So now that we are in a, yeah, you're gonna have to write. And Mover and Sanger, this is for the quarter revision people. The Mover and Sanger, the quarter revision for the Tate Drain Branch E 2021 be called to order at 7.35. Jagir and Lewis on paper, carried. Okay, George, can you give us an overview? Uh, absolutely. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, the, tonight's meeting is the quarter revision. Um, quarter revision is to discuss the distribution of cost of a municipal drain. Um, on this, at this point, um, there's already been a provisional bylaw passed, meaning we're not here to discuss the scope of work, the cost associated with that scope of work, or any alternatives. Um, we're here solely to talk about the distribution of cost. Um, another thing to note is we cannot reduce costs. Costs can only be changed from one landowner to the other. So costs can be taken from one landowner and assessed to another landowner. However, they cannot be removed. Um, the engineer's estimated cost of this report, uh, I'm just going to double check that before I state it, but um, it's $43,000, meaning at the end of the night, there still needs to be $43,000 assessed to all the landowners. So what we need here tonight, um, if I don't believe there has been any written appeals, but I do believe there is desire for um, verbal appeals if the municipality will allow. Um, and what we need tonight is for the landowners to state um, why they think they're assessed unfairly and what they wish, where they wish that cost to be distributed to. So if they believe that their assessment is too high, they need to describe to us why they think that is too high and where they think that cost should be um, distributed to. Um, we also note that um, this is a quarter revision, so members of council who are not members of the court shouldn't be participating in the in the conversation. Um, it, it, that's been brought before the tribunal as an issue in the past. So, um, on that note, like I said, there hasn't been any written appeals. Typically, I would present evidence um, in response to a written appeal, but we do not have a written appeal to this date. So, I would. Um, suggest that if the municipality is willing to accept verbal appeals, we would hear verbal appeals before I present my evidence as um, there has not been anything for me to present evidence in regards to at this point. Okay, thank you, George. Allison, is there uh, any written comments or objections to be received? Through your worship, uh, George was correct that we haven't received any written comments. Okay. Uh, okay. Mr. M Mr. Donor and uh, Leon Passbar. I believe you're on. Do you yep. wish to make, do you wish to make any comments? I think before you allocate the cost, you should prove the project if the project is right or wrong. I mean, I think the project is wrong. Based on that wrong project, you cannot allocate the cost. You have to go go a step back first before you can step make a step forward. That's my comment. So, Mr. Donor, are you appealing the cost that you think it should be revised? The whole what? project is wrong and too expensive. Because the, the project is wrong, the cost is too high. There's not that much land draining into the Tate drain, but uh, Mike DeVos had planned that would go into the Tate drain. Only about 10% of that area he has who, who plans to go into the Tate and actually goes into the Tate drain and it will not need such a big, big uh, project on the, on the Tate drain to fix that issue. I think uh, if you drive by there now, that the, the, the extra 10 inch tile is in for two years, there is no extra erosion, nothing. Everything is the same than two years ago. I think nothing needs to be done. That's my opinion. So are you formally having a, a, a request to have an appeal to the cost? The costs are too high for everybody, not only for me. But you, you have to formally tell us verbally that you wish to make an appeal. 
President of America can appeal. Okay, so done. Leon, have you any comments? Uh, just for clarity, um, the cost allocation, and perhaps George could jump in here. My understanding is that the cost allocation being discussed tonight is based on the report as it currently is written, correct? That is correct. So based on the court or based on the fact or based on the report as it's currently written, then I have no uh, objection to the cost allocation. However, I think it's worth mentioning, and I'm not sure whether it's for the court of uh, uh, revision tonight, but there is an appeal process going through the tribunal to discuss concerns about the report itself. That is correct, Leon, and we'll address that later on. Right, so for tonight's meeting, based on the report as it's currently written, then I don't have an objection to the cost allocation for ourselves. Okay, thank you, Leon. Is Greg Underhill there? I don't see his name or anything. Uh, Robert Jones is here with us tonight. Okay. Mr. Jones, did you, do you have a comment? No, not really. Okay. Is there anyone else on the drain that wishes to make comments? Okay, seeing none. For the members on the quarter revision, any questions or comments? Okay, so we will re recess for a very short period of time into the chambers over here and uh, we will come back with a decision. Let's make the agreement with us in there. There's a red thing for the charge. So, I was wondering if you can. I don't have his name. No. Is George going to have his name?
Okay, sorry about that. Mover and second of the quarter revision members for the Tate Drain Branch E2021 to hereby accept the recommendations of the drainage engineer, Mike DeVos, Streets Associate London Limited, and further does hereby confirm the drainage, in, in, drainage assessment as outlined in the report of the drainage engineer dated April 23rd, 2021. So Mover and seconder Lewis and Jagir are in favor. Jerry. And mover in sight of the quarter revision uh, relating the Tate Drain Branch E2020. We adjourn and council reconvene at 7.48. Jaguar and Lewis, all in favor, carried. Allison, can you provide a review of the next steps, please, for those on this train? So the next steps are if you are dissatisfied with the decisions of the Court of Revision, which were pronounced the 16th day of June, 2022, landowners may appeal this decision to the Agricultural Food and Rural Affairs Appeal Tribunal by filing a notice of appeal with the clerk of the township within 21 days of the date of this decision. If any appeals are submitted, a tribunal will be scheduled to review these appeals. The tribunal has the power to fix costs of the hearing and award them against a party to the hearing. Where decisions of the tribunal may be appealed, the appeal is then heard by the drainage referee. Mr. Donor, do you understand what uh, Allison has just stated? I don't see him on. Your Worship, it appears that his microphone is on mute, if he could unmute uh, before speaking. Mr. Donor, are you there? It's right. good. No, yeah, the book, now it's, now it's on, now I'm on. Uh, yeah, I yeah, understood what uh, Allison said, yeah. Okay, so do you understand the next steps if you aren't happy that you still have a process where you can appeal to the drainage tribunal? Yeah, in 21 days. Yes. Yeah. Okay. George, do you want to give an overview of what happens when we go to the drainage tribunal? I can try to provide some insight. Um, the drainage tribunal is an independent organization, so I can't predict 
precisely what they would do, but I would say in a typical drainage situation, they will receive um, uh, they will receive all appeals, both from consideration appeals, um, which was a 40 day window from consideration, plus any quarter revision appeals, which was the 21 days from quarter revision, um, would compile those and then make a decision on how best to address all appeals. Um, typically, they put all appellants and all appeals in one tribunal, which they will organize with all the parties who wish to make an appeal and, and all um, witnesses that may be necessary, such as um, township staff or contractors, um, and then proceed with a tribunal date um, that can accommodate everybody. Um, that will typically um, be handled within a year, but not immediately. Um, and that will be completed before we go to third and final reading. Okay, thank you, George. Thank you all for attending. And we're gonna move on to our, our next thing on our agenda. Thank you, Your Worship and members of council. Next, we have a public meeting, and this is, is in regard to a, a zoning classification, part lot five, concession five. And Allison just stated we would need a mover and second to the public meeting concerning the zoning bylaw amendment application number D14 Z0622 of G and M. G and M. Howe and Sons related to the property located at part lot five, concession five, Township Malahide known as 7077-7841 Rogers Road be called to order at 753. Moving seconder, Winder and Cerna on favor. Uh, the purpose of this meeting is the, uh, a, a zoning change that remains in general agriculture A1 zone with site-specific provision, the general agriculture A1-22 zone. Applicants are um, G&M Howe and the, or the agent is David Rowe. Allison, could you advise and confirm the method of date of notice, please? Yes, do your worship. Notice of this meeting was given in the prescribed manner by publication in the Onward Express on May 25th and June 1st. In addition, affected property owners within 120 meters were sent a notice by mail at minimum 20 days prior to the meeting. Thank you. Adam, can you give us an overview? Thank you, your worship. So council will recall seeing this associated consent application. It's a lot addition for the subject property. A report photo is shown on page 30 of the agenda. Uh, the, the lot addition reduces the, the lot area of one of the parcels involved, so that requires a site-specific zone change to acknowledge the reduced uh, lot area. It's being placed into the A1-21 zone, a draft bylaws in front of Council this evening uh, on page, scrolling down, it starts on page 39, so it's simply a site-specific uh, zone to acknowledge the reduced lot size. So if there's any uh, further questions from those in attendance in the public or from council, I'll, I'll be uh, able to answer. Okay, thank you, Adam. Questions for Adam on this application? None. Mover and second, a public meeting concerning the zoning bylaw amendment application D14-06-22 of GNM Howe and Sons related to the property located at part lot five, concession five, Township Malahide, known as 7077 and 7841 Rogers Road be adjourned and council reconvene. 755. Lewis and Glinsky on favor. Carried. And we're in report number DS22 27, titled Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application of GM Howe and Sons be received. And the Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application D14 
of GNM Howland be authorized and relate the property located at part lot five, concession five, Township of Malahide, known as 7077-7841 Rogers Road be approved for the reasons set out in this report. Moore and Widner on paper. And finally, move and second to bylaw number 22-42, being a bylaw to amend zoning bylaw number 18-22, insofar as it relates to the property owned by GM Howe and Sons, located at part lot five, concession five, Township of Malahide. We get a first, second, third reading and property signed and sealed. Serta and Glinsky on paper. Next, we have another public meeting. Mover and seconder the public meeting concerning the zoning bylaw amendment application of D14 Z07 22 of Scott Hayhoe Farms, Inc., relating to the property located at part lot 32, concession three, Council Malahide, known as 52947 and 52887, call nine, call to order at 757. Jagger and uh, Widner on paper. Great. Purpose of this public meeting is to consider an application of uh, Lot 32, Concession 3, Township of Malahide from General Agriculture A1 to Special Agriculture A2 Zone and Small Lot Agriculture A4 Zone. Allison, could you advise and confirm the method and date of notice, please? Through your worship, notice of the meeting was given in the prescribed manner by publication in the Elmer Express on May 25th and June 1st. In addition, affected property owners with 120 meters were sent a notice by mail at minimum 20 days prior to the meeting. Thank you. Adam, can you give us an overview? Certainly, thank you. So the subject application is was um, applied as a condition for a, an approved severance at the county. So this is a surplus farmhouse severance as well, and, and Council's uh, well familiar with how the surplus farmhouse severance process goes, but for those on the line who aren't, uh, when the, the houses are declared surplus, the remnant farm parcel is to be placed into a, uh, a special agricultural zone that prohibits the establishment of a new residential dwelling, and that's for, uh, for agricultural protection purposes. Uh, but Council, sometimes we, we come across applications that entail uh, not just one residence being deemed declared surplus, but in this case, there are two legally established single detached dwellings that the acquiring farmer doesn't need. So in this case, uh, and the severance has gone through, there's two existing dwellings being declared surplus from the subject property. And, and the report photo is shown on page 44. Um, so in all other respects, uh, that this is a, a standard surplus from a severance and, and staff have no further comments to add. Um, special circumstances on this one, two houses are being severed, not just one. Okay, thank you, Adam. Scott, have you got anything to add? You're muted. Uh, no, nothing for me, thanks. Okay, uh, anyone else on this application wish to make comment? Questions from council? Seeing none, mover and seconder, a public meeting concerning zoning bylaw amendment application number D14. Z07-22 of Scott Hayhoe Farms, Inc. Related to the property at Lot 32, Concession 3, Township of Malahide, known as 52947 and 52887 Calton Line. Be adjourned and the council reconvene at 8 o'clock. Seconder. Second Lewis and Glinsky, all in favor, carried. And a mover and seconder of the report number DS22 28 entitled Zoning Bylaw Amendment Capsification of Scott Hayhoe Farms Inc. be received. Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application D14 Z07 22 Scott Hayhoe Farms Inc. relating to the property at Lot 32, Concession 3, Township of Malahide, known as 52947 and 52887, call it in line, be approved for the reasons set out in this report. Jagger and Lewis, all in favor, carried.
And finally, movement sector bylaw number 22-43 being a bylaw to amend zoning bylaw number 18-22. Insofar as it relates to the property owned by Scott Hayhoe Farms, Inc. Located at part lot 32, concession three, Township of Malahide, be given a first, second, third reading, property sign and seal. Vinsky and Widner, all in favor? Thank you folks for attending. Jeff, you're up next. Evening folks, um, council, just uh, this is my May report. Uh, I'd like to highlight a couple of parts of the report that since uh, the COVID restrictions have received, have definitely broken down and got away from us there a bit. We're starting to get back into a regular, um, regular grind with the fire department and being able to, our public educators are getting back out in the, schools again so we've been out and did some school readings uh in springfield school here um last week we had a homeschool group in and tour the fire hall as well um and able to get out with do some public education with the fireworks in port bruce and get that event done as well um we'll also this weekend be helping with the fun day activities here in springfield which include a boot drive for muscular dystrophy and um Helping the Optus with their breakfast. Uh, we have the fire safety trailer there for the kids to go through. And um, they're also hosting the spaghetti dinner in the evening. So um, the Port Bruce fireworks, they had over 200 children through the pavilion and gave away uh, public safety information and stuff like that. And there was over 2,000 people they figured at the fireworks that the fire department hosted. So oh, good. good to get back out in the community and help out. So if anybody's got any other questions on the report, I'll be happy to answer. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Question for Jeff on his activity report. Mover and second report number F22-09 entitled Emergency Services Activity Report may be received. Mover and Cerna, all in favor? Carry. Thank you, Jeff. Matt, are you doing the next one? Uh, for the next one here, we've got uh, Talia, the Township's Asset Management Analyst, that's going to kick things off with our uh, Asset Management Update. Okay, Talia, then you're on. Council, oh, turn the mic on. Bear with me one moment here. I'm just going to start the presentation. There is a bit of a lag. There we go. Okay, the report before you outlines the asset management plan updates staff undertook in order to move the municipality towards compliance with Ontario Regulation 588.17, Asset Management Planning for Municipal Infrastructure. 588.17 has a timeline of actions to be completed by municipalities. Uh, development of a strategic asset management policy was the first requirement in 2019. As Council is aware, Watson and Associates were engaged to undertake the development of a policy and to redesign and update the asset management plan at that time. The next step, due July 1st of this year, requires staff to perform an update of the plan for core assets only. These are the applicable core assets. A review has not yet been completed on non-core assets, so the 2019 Watson forecast will continue to be used for those assets during this update. An update of all assets will be completed and the full plan will re be represented to Council prior to the 2023 budgetary process. So the requirements of this update include a review of the plan's four main components. I will review the asset inventories and current levels of service. Then Matt will review the life cycle activities that were established to maintain those current levels of service. And then Adam Boylan will review the funding strategies for those life cycle activity costs. So for all asset inventories, 588.17 requires the asset data to be no older than two years prior to the current year. So an update was completed with the most current data available from uh, the 2021 roads needs study, the 2020 OSIM report and discussions with staff and the uh, water and wastewater 2013 uh, rate studies. 
So to, deter to determine current levels of service, a level of service analysis was undertaken. A level of service analysis defines performance measures by which service objectives can be evaluated. 58817 prescribes certain performance measures marked with an asterisk. The service objective for roads is to provide a safe and reliable road network to connect residents and businesses. So the performance measures for this objective are divided into three categories. Safety, which is measured by the average asset condition. Reliability, which is measured by the number of annual closures. And interconnectivity, which is measured by the lane kilometers per square kilometer of land percentage. This is dictated by 588.17. It's a little confusing, but that's their measurement. Uh, the service objective for bridges and culverts is to provide safe and reliable assets to connect residents and businesses. Performance measures for this objective are also divided into three categories. Safety measured by asset, average asset conditions, Reliability by closures and restrictions, and interconnectivity is measured by the percentage of crossings serviced with an asset. So the service objective for the water distribution system is to provide a safe and reliable system throughout the municipality. The performance measures for this objective are categorized by safety, measured by average asset condition, reliability measured by service interruptions and fire flow coverage and inclusivity measured by the percentage of property service. The service objective for the wastewater collection system is to provide a safe and reliable system throughout the municipality. Performance measures for this objective are also categorized by safety measured by average asset condition, reliability by service disruptions, and inclusivity is measured by the percentage of properties connected. So based on this service level analysis of the updated asset inventories, these current levels of service have now been defined for core assets. So now from here, the life cycle activities that would allow core assets to be maintained at these current levels of service may now be reviewed. Um, I will now run through a few slides which indicate a high level overview of these life cycle activities to maintain the level of service require requirements that Talia has mentioned on the various core assets, uh, which are built into the financial plan to accommodate like for like maintenance and replacement of these assets. So on this first slide, uh, we have uh, our road network, which these are typical graphs, graphs which I'm sure you've all seen before, which indicate how various life cycle preventative maintenance activities extend the life of an asset compared to allowing it to fall to a poor physical condition, since a poor condition is generally unsafe or unreliable and also costly to rebuild, uh, relying on quick funding during quick depreciation. So the township has various roads shown here, uh, high class bituminous being paved roads, where life cycle activities include uh, appropriately inspected timing for crack stealing, microsurfacing, shave and pave and full reconstruction. Uh, the center chart is uh, low, cl low class bituminous, which is surface treated roads, which can be reapplied with single surface treatment and double surface treatment uh, as shown versus the completely reconstruction curve. And uh, the furthest right slide uh, chart is the gravel road strategy uh, with uh, surface gravel reapplication activities compared to complete base and surface replacement. As Talia mentioned, uh, these activities are all based on the recently adopted road needs study and uh, the degradation timeline advised by that study. Uh, here we have our, uh, our bridges. Uh, they're a little simpler on a chart, however difficult and expensive in the field with minimal in, uh, invasive maintenance available. So showing here essentially is reha rehabilitation versus a steep drop off if no rehab rehabilitation or reconstruction is planned. Uh, due to the steep drop-off, the township adopts uh, inspection guideline per the Ontario Structure Inspection Manual every two years. And here we show how bridge uh, rehab is triggered with a BCI reaching 45 out of 99, which could include various parging activities or invasive activities such as jacking the deck and complete repairs. The chart on the right uh, are for large culverts, which are based on full reconstruction at a bridge condition index of 35. There are other rehab methods available, such as slip lining. However, those are expensive undertakings and will be looked at on project-specific basis based on OSIM inspections. 
for our projection purposes, we maintain with the depreciation model suggested by Watson's in the previous plan. And uh, as staff, we can now better track and predict uh, this degradation over time. Next one. Here with our water assets, we show the water main strategy being replacement of metallic fittings at around the 40 year mark and reconstruction of PVC main at 100 year mark. Uh, I'd like to note that the last AC main in the township is set for reconstruction in 2023 per the Greenstream grant provided. So we don't require multiple timeline charts for various construction materials. Uh, all township water main following this project will be PVC with a life cycle of 100 years. Uh, we also show our hydrant strategy here, which uh, accommodates the internal components to be rebuilt at 35 years and full replacement in 75 years. Uh, next, sticking with water here, uh, we have our boost and station, booster station strategy, which includes uh, billing rehab at 30 years and replacement at 75 years. And there are various other system components that have their own life cycles not shown here, which include pump rebuilds and replacement at three-year intervals and pressure reducing valve replacements every five years. Uh, also, here's an example where intervention measures aren't available with our water meter and sample station strategy, relying only on replacement. Uh, at the end of their useful life. And lastly, we have a wastewater asset strategy, uh, which indicates collection mains replacement at 80 year time frame and sewage pumping stations, which include various intervention measures being roof and electrical rehab at 30 years, well piping at 40 years, and building replacement at 100 years. And again, there are other component life, uh, life cycle activities not shown in the pumping station being various various other components of generators, pumps, valves, level monitoring, lifting equipment, um, and flow meters, power vents, other things like that, that do have their own life cycles and are noted in the appendices of the asset management plan. I'll pass things off to Adam Boylan for the financial component. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, so this is the financial plan for tax uh, funded assets. It includes roads, bridges, facilities, streetlights, sidewalks, vehicles, and equipment. Uh, the bars represent the magnitude of each future year's capital budget. The average capital budget around um, over the 20 year span is about 3.3 million, uh, with the latter decade being around 3.6. The black line represents uh, the solid black line <clears throat> represents the township's cumulative capital reserve balance. As expressed during the 2022 budget, <clears throat> I feel our current reserve balances are generally topping out and will be drawn upon in future years. <clears throat> Excuse me. Lies. The dotted black line represents tax, tax contributions to capital reserves. We're estimating the need to grow that amount by 3% per year going forward. That equates to an annual increase between $55,000 to $65,000 over the next couple decades. Uh, overall, including the impact to assessment growth, we think that this would fit into a plan that would limit rate increases to 2.5% to 3%, roughly speaking. Conversely, the 2019 asset management plan called for a 3.97 increase from 2020 to 2028 and a 3.57% increase from 2029 to, 20, uh, to 2038. So we've shaved that down. The overarching philosophy of this plan is to mitigate the use of capital, capital deferrals as a financing strategy uh, by allowing capital budget costs to slightly exceed our reserve contributions, meaning our reserve balances would slowly be drawn upon. During this time, we'd be slowly building up our reserve contributions until they're in line with their expected capital budgets. This is essentially a transition from what I would call a reserve focus strategy to a greater emphasis on what is often called a pay as you go. Of particular note, debt uh, was used in the 2019 version of the AMP. We've taken it out completely for the purposes of this update. We may consider recommending debt in the future to further spread costs. Uh, of our financial plan to future years, particularly if there's issues with affordability or if debt servicing costs are very low, leading into a high cost capital budget year. Uh, but under normal circumstances for the purposes of this plan, we're assuming debt usage will be reserved for growth related projects or uh, significant strategic initiatives. Moving on to water. As we know from the 2022 budget, we're working with a very low reserve balance uh, position to start with, uh, which diminishes the flexibility of our water financial plan. However, major capital expenditures are fairly few and far between going forward, so there's time to build financial capacity when needed. Uh, this is this financial plan in general is more of a stopgap measure until we have Watson's 2023 rate study, uh, which will be presented to the new council. But from what we currently know, 
We're recommending a 3% increase to reserve contributions uh, for water as well. The main driver of this is a 2040 project which seeks to loop Malahide's tertiary water system. Though this project is recommended from an operations perspective, a low, lower rate increase could be offered without it. So you can see that uh, the larger bar in, in the, to the right there represents that project. Moving on to sewer. Uh, the township sewer system has a very small rate base, which will likely pose challenges in the future. Thankfully, such impacts are expected to be seen until well after 2041. The system is still very young and major capital replacements aren't being contemplated in the scope of this review. Uh, much like how the 2022 budget was handled, contributions to reserves are actually expected to re remain stable or potentially marginally decline. Uh, if future projects are identified, rate, rate um recommendations will be adjusted accordingly. And again, this is a bit of a stopgap measure until we have Watson's rate study come forward. Thank you. Okay, future improvements. So this asset management plan represents the building blocks of a new asset management planning process. There is a lot of work to be done and improvements to be made. Although this update was triggered by a legislative requirement, the intent is to make the asset management plan a live document in order to provide council, staff, and the public with the most current information. Continuously pursuing opportunities for improvement, such as including previously omitted assets, will allow this document to be used as a tool during the annual budgetary process and for future grant opportunities. The annual stat status reviews with council will also illustrate the progress being made. So the next steps would be to submit this plan update to the province, continue the update for all other assets, and to present the budget committee with the full plan update for 2023 budgetary decision-making process. So between the three of us, we would be happy to answer questions at this time. Okay. Thank you, Talia and Adam and uh, Matt. Questions for council for any of these individuals? Doni? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, mine's more of a, a comment. Um, I don't know about anybody else, but this is the kind of stuff that actually helps me sleep at night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, I, I know that we, we had challenges around, you know, reserves and, and whenever there was a surplus, we say, oh yeah, let's put it in reserves because our reserves are too low. But I felt like we didn't have a strong rationale for, but how much do we really need? How, how, uh, how much do we need to save and, and what's the long-term plan? So um, between an inventory and the analysis and targets and then this, you know, financial analysis, like, okay, now I feel like we, we can, we have the business case and we have the information. And I know there's um, more information to come and I know it's going to be a dynamic document because there are a lot of variables that can change. But to me, you can, you can't change a plan if you don't have a plan. Um, so I want to say kudos and thank you for the uh, extra sleep I'm going to get. <laughs> Any other questions or comments from council? See none. Mover and second report number PW 22-32 entitled asset management plan update be received that pursuant to section five of the Ontario regulations 588-17 asset, ma asset management plan dated May 6, 2022, be approved. It being pointed out the Director of Finance as the Executive Lead of the Municipality has endorsed the Asset Management Plan as presented. And that consideration of the Asset Management Plan be made a part of the annual budgeting process to ensure that sufficient capital funds are available to fund the Asset Management Plan. And that Asset Management Plan be updated as needed to reflect the current priorities of the Township. Jagir, Cerna, all in favor, carry. Matt, you're doing the contract extension for clean water? Yes, that's correct. Uh, through you, Your Worship, uh, this staff report is brought before Council for the purpose of an extension to the Ontario Clean Water Agency contract for wastewater collection system services. Uh, so it was in accordance with uh, the in-place contract that council authorized staff to enter into negotiations with Aqua for an extension of the contract. Staff are very pleased with Aqua's oversight of the waste system, which includes all sanitary sewers, pumping stations, and force main infrastructure. And on, accordingly, only minor revisions to the contract were sought, as noted in the report. 
uh, which mostly relate to the descriptive language of the system and actual field practice to maintain consistency of the operators. So uh, as noted, the annual cost of the system is a total of $31,500 uh, in, that, in that range, uh, which is accounted for in the township sewer rates and is set to increase in accordance with CPI. And accordingly, staff recommend this five-year extension to the aqua contract, which will be in place as of January 1st, 2023. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Questions for Matt on the extension of the contract? Being done. Move and second report number PW22-38 entitled Contract Extension Ontario Clean Water Agency be received. Township enter an agreement with the Ontario Clean Water Agency for a five-year period for the purpose of the operation maintenance and the Malahide Wastewater Collection Sewer System. Whitner and Cerna, all in favor, Gary. And you're doing the next one on the Ontario Clean Water again? Uh, yes, uh, this report is similar to the prior uh, Aqua Sewer Contract Extension, but this one's for out of the Malahide uh, water side. So similarly, council authorized staff to negotiate with Aqua for a similar five-year extension. And again, only minor revisions were required. This contract largely relating to infrastructure description. Uh, the cost of operating the Malahide system is approximately $83,000 in 2023 and set for CPI adjustment thereafter. Uh, further, this extension has been authorized by both the Elmer and Port Burwell secondary boards at their meeting held uh, June 9th for their respective apportionments. And staff do recommend council extend this contract and sign on behalf of the respective secondary boards. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Questions for Matt on this one? Seeing none, mover and second report number PW22-39 on title contract extension, Ontario Clean Water Agency be received. Township enter an agreement with the Ontario Clean Water Agency for a five-year period for the purpose of the operation and maintenance of the Malahide water system. The township on behalf of the PBASWSSS and ADASWSS Joint Board of Management enter an agreement with the Ontario Clean Water Agency for a five-year period for the purpose of the operation of maintenance of the secondary water system in the Port Burwell Area Secondary Water Supply System. Glinsky and Lewis on paper. Carry. Allison, you're doing the next one in, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Mark. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through the Matt. Matt, I understand we've lost one of your signs out on Wilson there, a lot. Um, you know what we can do, we used to put a special coating on the post that would stop some of that stuff. Maybe we should go back to that, but that's getting expensive and it's very annoying. Well, what's the timeline to get them replaced? Um, we have noticed the, a number of warning and speed signage theft on Wilson line uh, as of lately. Uh, when that was reported to staff and recognized, uh, we did order all new signage, but uh, unfortunately right now there's kind of a disruption in the supply chain when it comes to signs. So we have been waiting for some time uh, to receive the signs. And uh, I, I've checked uh, recently into the status of that and it's still unknown on getting uh, those signs uh, back in stock. So once we do have them, they'll go back up, but we can certainly look at um, prone, problem prone areas, looking at some type of deterrent measure. Thank you. All right, Allison, the Integrity Commissioner, please. Through you, Worship, the current Integrity Commissioner closed meeting investigator and municipal ombudsman that the township retains with the County of Elgin and other lower tier municipalities has provided notice that they will no longer provide these services after September 30th. Combining the transparency and accountability of the, these three roles will provide one point of contact for council, members of the public, and staff. The county would take the lead in developing and issuing the RFP in consultation with participating local municipal partners. In addition, to, in addition to creating a workflow efficiency on behalf of local municipalities who are interested in this approach, a jointly issued RFP for multiple participating municipalities is likely to provide a greater response to the RFP. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you, Allison. Questions for Allison on the Integrity Commissioner in closed meeting? I see it's, I think it's on in the Wednesday's paper it was already advertised, wasn't it? Yeah, I thought so. Seeing none, report number 
Uh, Clerk 22-08, entitled Appointment of Integrity Commissioner, Closed Meeting Investigator Om Ombudsman Service be received. The Township Partner in the Joint RFP with the County of Elgin and interested local municipal partners to secure a new service provider to fulfill the transparency, accountability, and roles of Integrity Commissioner, Closed Meeting Investigator, and Municipal Ombudsman. Moore and Glinsky, all in favor? Carry. Okay, Adam, you're doing the next one on the water for Springfield. Thank you, Your Worship. Our consultant is on the line this evening to make a presentation, but a quick uh, history to this. Um, servicing Springfield with water was an item brought up in the service delivery and organizational review that, that was finalized in, in 2020. Um, last year, staff undertook an, an RFP process to retain a, a qualified consultant to look look for the township at doing a feasibility analysis to sort of let's make sure it makes sense before taking any um, larger drastic steps with regards to to doing what would be a rather large infrastructure endeavor. Um, so with that, uh, I do know that uh, Jamie Witherspoon from WT Infrastructure Solutions is available. And if Jamie, you're able, if you can uh, begin your presentation. Are you there, Jamie? Yeah, yeah I'm here. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen here, if that's okay. Um, can you see that okay? We're good. Okay, perfect. All right. So thank you, um, um, uh, Your Worship, uh, members of the Council. I'm here, uh, as Adam indicated, to discuss the feasibility study for the port potable water distribution uh, to the village of Springfield. Um, Give you a little background. WT Infrastructure is a small engineering firm uh, based in, in Guelph, and uh, we, our specialty is sort of um, um, small and medium medium sized municipal infrastructure uh, like these sort of projects. And so our goal is to sort of help the, the community uh, determine the best path forward. And uh, if we can be of any advice, we're glad to do that. Um, I'm going to go through an overview of the, the uh, the project. Uh, I'll talk a bit about the background. A lot of stuff you'll already know, but I just want to sort of it builds to the understanding of, of how the uh, how we came to our, our assessment. Um, we'll talk about growth, um, the water supply options that we looked at, um, the preferred set of alternatives. Then we'll get into the uh, nitty gritty cost estimates. Um, and then talk about issues of the project, um, the implications, although this is a water project, wastewater is a uh, is a um, uh, an issue um, and uh, and is important to understand because it's a it's a outcome of the water. Uh, and then we'll talk about a conclusions, uh, recommendations, and then next steps. So the village of Springfield currently uh, has a population of approximately 890 people um, that are uh, occupying about 285 residential units. Um, the existing water supply is all private wells um, with uh, uh, wastewater being provided as, as you talked about with, with pre earlier in this meeting uh, with a pumping station uh, at near the uh, Ontario Police College to the uh, um, to the Elmer Lagoon. So that you're, you discharge your wastewater uh, into the Elmer system and you have an allocation there. So that allocation is currently 469 cubic meters a day. And you're, you're currently, the community is currently using about 240 cubic meters a day. So um, that they're using about 50% of the capacity. To develop. That remaining 50% is still available uh, for use by growth. So community growth um, is what is driving of this project to some extent. So the recent five-year update and comprehensive review of the official plan uh, for the, the township uh, focused the growth areas within the community in one area around Springfield. So um, there's two options that were looked at. One was the five-year growth option and 25-year growth option. The five-year growth option um, essentially was 79 hectares, um, which for
60 residential units and up to around 2,900 people. Uh, the 25 year growth. Jamie, you're breaking up. Sorry, I'm, I'm back. Did you lose me there? Yeah, you were just breaking up, so. Uh, I apologize. Um, my internet should be fine. I apologize if it's, uh, unfortunately I have teeny. <coughs> so if I break up again, um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try it on. Hopefully it won't be an issue. Um, but so we looked at, uh, I'm not sure how far I have to go back, but the five-year growth of 79 hectares, 43 hectares of it was residential with 860 residential units um, 20, and with about 2,900 people. Um, the 25 year growth is another 93 hectares of additional growth, which 50.6 hectares of that is gonna be residential growth, representing about 1,000 uh, residential units or another 3,400 people. So what that impacts in terms of water and wastewater is, um, is the five-year demand is looking at about 2,200 cubic meters per day. And the 25-year growth is, is an additional 4,300, or is, sorry, it's 4,300 cubic meters per day. So that's compared to the fact that right now you're looking at you know uh, about 240, you're looking at about 20 times uh, the, the capacity. So that's that's a huge change. And, um, and the growth is also um, limited by the water supply and wastewater capacity. So essentially, growth can still occur without this happening. The problem is it's a different kind of growth and, it's, and it makes it very difficult and it's hard to get it uh, approved where the, what the growth now objectives is to have fully serviced properties. So the water supply options that we looked at, we looked at seven primary options, um, a do nothing alternative, which is essentially not, not to proceed. Um, the, the other option what, that we looked at was um, uh, alternative B1, which was a full build out groundwater supply. So basically supplying all of the water supply uh, from groundwater rather than using um, the current system that's supplied to, from to Elmer, the Elgin system. Um, we looked at another alternative, which was B2, which is essentially an interim groundwater supply. So now that's currently um, supplying the current community with groundwater and then adding water main as development happens uh, for the ultimate buildup. So bringing uh, a piped water supply from Albert for that ultimate buildup. Um, alternative C uh, was a uh, Elmer water supply. So in other words, bringing water up Hacienda Road and across uh, Ramakiel Road to um, to Springfield via um, via that water main by a new water main from there with a um, a ground level storage in other words a, a storage that would be uh, a tank concrete tank in the ground and then uh, uh, high lift pumping or, or pressurizing systems to bring it up to the uh, to provide fire flow and, and pressure for the system um, located in Springfield then alternative D which is very similar to that except instead of having in-ground storage, we would have uh, elevated storage, so a, a water tower. Um, and that would allow us to boost the water and it is a bit more efficient option. Um, alternative E was an, a one we brought up through discussions um, uh, with, the with the township in terms of bringing the water around um, from the other side of Elmer, um, directly from the Elgin system, from the Elgin, Elgin second, uh, sorry, the Elmer, secondary water supply system off the Elgin system and not going through Elmer. Um, and that was a longer system, but it provided a bit more access to some other uh, development opportunities. And then the final option we looked at was uh, a joint elevated storage uh, option with Elmer and or the Ontario Police College. So when we looked at these options, um, we rejected sort of four of them relatively quickly. Uh, the do not nothing alternative. Um, it's always there, but it sort of is. It's if, if you're looking at feasibility, it's it it uh, it doesn't really get you anywhere. It, it allows 
it allows a small amount of development, about 237 properties, but then you run out, you would run out of wastewater capacity and, uh, and you'd be doing larger properties because you would have to do it on, on, uh, on wells. Um, the other alternative we looked at was uh, full build out of groundwater supply. So that would require for 4,300 cubic meters a day, we would require a number of well sites um, and basically treatment and all those components, plus all of the, most of the components that are associated with getting water through the Elgin system, um, except you're, you're treating it and then you're responsible for that as well. So you're, it's a little bit of a, a additional challenge. Plus there, it was identified that, um, that the groundwater in, in, uh, in the, the Springfield area has some, some challenges for treatment that, we, that would also increase the cost significantly. Um, as, as well, for the same reasons, the interim water supply um, was identified as, as not optimal because when we got down to cost, it was cheaper to uh, bring the water from, from the existing um, regional system rather than to try to new, try something new. The other option that was interesting was the alternative F, which was uh, a joint elevated storage with Elmer. Elmer is currently proceeding with a class EA for a new storage facility. Um, and um, the problem with that is for it to be effective for uh, the town of the village of Springfield, it would have to be located in or very close to Springfield because of the elevation. Um, so it would not be easy to do both at and with Elmer because Elmer would need a larger component of it. It would have cost a significant amount. And because of where they were in the process, um, it just, what didn't seem to be feasible at this time because they are looking at proceeding quite quickly. The options that became feasible were essentially uh, three options. Um, one was the Elmer uh, supply. So continue extending past the police college um, up to, to the, the village of Springfield um, using the Elmer supply into a ground level storage tank and then pumping it into the community, um, which was 18.2 million. And that includes the water mains from, um, from the existing limits of the system to Springfield and then the distribution system in, the, in Springfield plus the storage and booster system. Um, alternative D, which was the option, um, again, that I just talked about, but it's an elevated storage tank, so which was 22.2 million. And then the direct water supply um, from Elmer, uh, going around Elmer um, to the Elmer secondary water supply system. This was a significantly an additional $10 million um, and didn't provide, it provided access to some development lands, but when we did the, the math, um, it would be very difficult to make it financially viable to go around, um, even if the water was less expensive and uh, because it was a limited amount, uh, limited opportunities for significant uh, servicing along that, that alignment. So the preferred options we basically uh, tied down at this stage were uh, the two options, which would be extending, both extending the water supply uh, up Hacienda Road to, uh, to Ron McNeil and then across uh, into, El into uh, Springfield. Um, with one having ground level storage and the other being elevated storage. From a technical perspective, they're very similar. Um, there's a, a cost difference between the two because the elevated storage is, is more expensive. Um, when you look at it if on a cost per residence basis, and we talk about it, and I'll, I'll talk about this a lot tonight, is unfunded versus funded. Unfunded is basically assuming that there's no um, upper tier uh, um, uh, grants provided for the project. So the unfunded cost would be uh, $8,500 per, per residence for the uh, ground level storage, uh, but that would have higher operating costs because essentially you're pumping it into an open tank and then you have to pump it fully again. So there's an additional cost of that. And then there's some reliability issues. You have to have some generators and other things that are, that are, that are required for uh, ensuring you have consistent water supply. Um, the elevated storage option, again, very similar. Unfunded cost um, is 10,300. Lower operating cost because you're only, you're only having to pump it once. And then um, it's more reliable because if the power goes out, uh, the gravity will still drain the tank and, and provide water, fire flow, and, and emergency demand for the community. 
Um, so cost is the next important discussion to have here. So the capital costs that we, the cost assumptions that we looked at, the capital cost included water mains and infrastructure. And so basically what that means is that the main 18 million or 22 million would cover up the cost to get the water in front of people's houses and, in, and into the development, into the edges of the development area. It wouldn't include the water main servicing in the development area, that would be part of their project. And then on the individual in the existing community, they would still have to make, there would still have to be a connect cost for the connection into their house, which would vary based on where the house is, um, from an estimated of five to $10,000 per property. Um, we included, this is a very early level study. Um, so um, we included 25% contingency at this point. Um, so the total cost per property is gonna vary depending on the option from probably about 13,500 um, to 20,300 per property. And that is all of the ultimate build of property. So I think that's important to recognize and I'll have that discussion a bit later. Um, and that cost is again, unfunded. <coughs> so the main question that comes out with, with when you look at feasibility studies is, is what's the viability of it? And then what's the advantages and disadvantages of, of to, and to whom? So um, for the existing residences, the advantages are safe, reliable water supply, um, improved fire protection. There currently is, is not hydrants and, uh, and, and in, that, in the community. So that, that would provide a, a, certainly a benefit to the community for long term. Uh, increased water supply reliability. And, and I know that wells are typically okay, but when they do go dry, when they do have problems, when you do have problems with them, it, uh, it can be significant. Um, it impacts the community as a whole by increasing the tax base. When you go from, you know, 280, 285 residences to, you know, close to 2000 residences, um, that's gonna have a significant impact on the taxes and, the, and tax revenue in the community. Um, the supply of water of water to a, a, an area um, increases the real estate values. It provides, you know, allows allows for more more uh, opportunities um, for better supply because you don't have that that liability of, of the well um, in, in your house, and it allows you to do more with your property as well. Um, and then the sort of um, less tangible uh, side of things is the, renew, renew, the rejuvenation of the village. Um, the schools and the businesses would be supported by the new growth in the new community. Um, there'd be new residences which would, which would add to that and add to the community and provide uh, benefits to the community in, in their participation in, in, in the township. Um, disadvantages, uh, cost. It's, it's, uh, it's, not a, it's not a cheap project. So cost is, is when people already have a, a well uh, and they already have a water supply and they already the toilet's already the toilet's always already flush and their taps produce water, so um, cost is is a, not a cost that they would be necessarily expecting. Um, ongoing operating costs they would go from not having a, a water bill to having a water bill, so that's that, that's an issue for residents who've been there for a while. For new residents who are moving in, um, it would not be a big concern. Um, this is a big project, so cost construction disruption will be. Uh, over a significant period of time and, and will be significant because you're digging up most of the roads in the area. Um, and then, you know, what's an advantage to some people would be a disadvantage to others, um, which is the increased density. So um, the community is gonna get bigger. So there'll be more people. Um, and so that, that, that may be a, a des defined as a disadvantage uh, to some. Uh, from the development perspective, um, you know, it, the safe water is, is a benefit for them. Um, putting wells in the property on uh, limits the size of the properties that they can build um, if they can build it at all. Um, it allows for increased density. Increased density means uh, more revenue for the developers, more uh, more population. Um, the, in comparison with uh, private servicing, uh, the connection cost and everything will be cheaper than doing uh, individual wells. Um, it'll provide higher real estate values for that for the developer, allowing it to uh, to, to get better revenue out of the project. So there's certainly benefits on that side of it. Um, the disadvantage, again, they, they will be paying a water bill um, and uh, that's, that's an issue and uh, construction dis, uh, disruption as well. Now, 
that would be an issue to some extent, but because the people that are moving into the development areas will be probably happening after the project is completed, um, that will be less of an issue. So affordability and affordability, and I want to sort of uh, preface this a bit. Affordability is a very um, subjective aspect. What's affordable to one person is, is unaffordable to somebody else. So what we've tried to do is, is look at this from a couple of different perspectives, um, recognizing that no cost isn't, isn't necessarily an option with this type of project. Um, but the goal is, is that you don't want to, it has, the goal is to be equitable. Um, so the cost should be shared between the existing users and the growth. They both get benefits from it. Um, the challenge is that if the growth does not occur immediately and is not guaranteed, so there's a risk. Um, if we have, if, if you the if you have 285 properties that are paying when they get the water connected to them versus another 1800, 1870 some that are are going to be built over the next five, 10, 25 years, um, that's that's going to take a while before they're going to they're going to be paying for that component of the project. Um, so the affordability that we looked at as well. Uh, considers uh, is is to the existing existing residents is more uh, is more of a consideration to them than it is to the growth and that's to mean that it's as part of the sale of the of, of a new house or a new development um, that cost will be all part of it so it won't really there won't be a separated cost that, that the people buying houses in the, the develop new development areas of Springfield will notice. Um, but it will be an issue for existing residents. <coughs> so there's lots of ways of looking at affordability. Well, CMHC, uh, the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation, so we looked at it from the perspective of, of what's affordable for your housing costs. So um, the CMHC talks about affordability at 30% of your after tax income. Um, and that's that's where oh, above that it becomes unaffordable. So we looked at, at the census data and looked at, at what um, in Springfield and looked at, and it, was, it wasn't the most recent stuff, it was from 2016, but it still gave us a, a perspective from, to look at it. So we looked at three sort of options as, as far as where affordability would fall. One option was to say, okay, your existing housing costs goes up 10%. So the average housing cost in Springfield is about uh, around eleven $1 hundred dollars a month, and or twelve hundred dollars a month. So the increase in um, in in uh, housing cost would be one hundred twenty three dollars, one hundred twenty three nine, sorry, one hundred twenty three dollars and nine cents. So one hundred twenty four dollars and an annual cost of about fifteen hundred dollars. The other way we looked at it was five percent of your after tax uh, single income. We do a lot of work up in the Blue Mountain areas and other, and where they have an affordability uh, policy for how they extend services, and that's the number they use, which is five percent of a single. They assume that it's a single income household, and that fifty percent of the sorry five percent of the median income, anything less than that, is considered affordable. So that's in, in Springfield, that would be uh, one hundred thirty eight dollars a month or sixteen hundred sixty dollars a year. And then we just put in $100 a month is, and so that comes out to 1200. That's sort of a, uh, just a sort of a, an arbitrary one. So based on the $22 million project cost and the upper servicing cost, so assuming it was $10,000 to connect and the 20 and the 10,300, um, and then financing it at 3.5% interest, um, the annual payments would be, um, you know, it would vary from the 10 year financing would be 24, 140, uh, 20 years, 1430, uh, 25 years, 1230, and 30-year, 1100. So basically, at, at, at the 10-year financing, it's not very affordable. It starts to get affordable at 20 years, and the longer you extend it, it's about 30 years. And the typical funding uh, that we see for these sort of projects is about a 30-year uh, funding thing. And, and, and it's done, it can either be done directly to taxes, it can be on the water bill, there's other ways of, or as a levy, there's different ways of doing it, but that's sort of the, and again, when I'm talking about the $22 million, I'm talking about unfunded costs. So this is assuming 
we're getting no no upper tier uh, funding for this project at this stage. So that then so we've we've come up with the, that there is a potential affordable um, way uh, to this project. The problem becomes is the for the township as a as as a municipality in terms of the financing risk. So if we look at the this is the eighteen million dollar scenario. It, it doesn't change a lot. It's just it, it, it's high. It's a bit higher. But under this scenario, the orange uh, line at the bottom, the orange part of the graph, that's the part that is paid by um, the re existing residents. It's about two million dollars. That two million dollars would be paid. Would you know? Would be financed and would be paid back. So that that debt would be serviced by that popular that population. So that's addressed. The gray area is the development. So under the gray and the bottom, uh, the bottom axis indicates that uh, you know as is zero to 100 percent. It's basically at 100 percent that's full build out, and it's uh, anything less than that is obviously the, the percentage of, of the available lands that are being built out. So um, you can see the yellow yellow uh, triangle there. That would be the debt that would be carried uh, by the township. Uh, based on the, on that sort of scenario, so if no growth occurred, so nothing happened, something, then the township would be carrying a you know uh, 16, 16 plus million dollar servicing a sixteen million dollar plus debt until that land was developed. Um, obviously, if that land develops quickly, that debt is serviced by somebody else. And, and it uh, it is resolved and be done through development charges. So it, it was a, is a reasonable approach to dealing with that. But I think it's really important to to recognize this risk because it's important to understand how it would be financed and how the growth would impact the project um, in terms of in terms of how how you're going to pay it off. Because if you don't want it, the, the challenge with this type of project is there isn't there isn't a sort of an easy phasing way of phasing in. You can't put in a a slightly smaller pipe um, and a slightly smaller tank, and and save a lot of money. You really are looking at, at um, the build it, they will come sort of scenario. So um, it is it is something that really is 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 important to to recognize. So that's the the sort of unfunded sort of situation. So now we're talking about the upper tier funding information. So what happens if there is funding available for the project? What if we can get uh, um, uh, provincial and federal funding? So unfunding, uh, unfunded cost on the left here, uh, $22 million, 2.4 of that is paid by the rate payers, 15.8 is paid by the development. So that's the risk portion. Um, if it's fully funded in terms of this sort of typical funding, then about $7.4 million um, Plus one third of serving cost would would then the existing rate payers would be paying about a million dollars and the development would be paying about six point four million dollars. So that sort of changes the equation significantly if that is to occur. And it, yeah, I think it's important to to look at both sides of this. So I showed this graph this earlier and said, you know what, this is this is what I talked about in terms of affordability. So if upper tier upper tier funding happens, then that twenty four hundred dollars falls to uh, eight fifteen. Um, the 1430 to 475, the uh, 1230 to 410, and the 1100 to 370. So it has a dramatic impact, obviously, on the uh, the affordability to existing residences if there is upper tier funding available. So we've got the if we've got the water to the house. So now the next question is where does it go after it leaves? And this is the this is the, the, the sort of elephant in the room that needs to be addressed as well. Um, as I said at the start of the presentation, um, the township has uh, is using about 50% of its allocation in the Almer wastewater treatment plant currently. So that equates to about 237 units that are available uh, left to be connected um, that could be added within the current uh, allocation. The 25 year build out is 1,872 units, and the uh, 860 units are, are, would be anticipated within five years. So, if we have 237, but we're going to have 860 in, in uh, 
in uh, five years, that that that's a concern. Um, so assuming linear development once the develop well, sorry linear development once they they start developing, um, capacity of the existing wastewater system would be reached within about one to one one to one point five years. So that's that's uh, that doesn't give you a lot of runway. Um, so the options that you have available to you at this stage are um, negotiate with Elmer uh, to participate in an anticipated expansion of their facility. Um, their facility is getting, is to our understanding, getting close to capacity as well. So um, they might be looking at this in the near, not too distant future. Um, you know, based on a sort of linear approach and, and standard treatment plant design, you're probably looking at a, 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 a um, Springfield's component of this being about 10 to $20 million. Um, um, if the other option would be Springfield could, the Malahide could go on its own, um, build a, a, its own plant. Um, and that would be looking at probably 20 to $30 million because there isn't a large sort of water course nearby. <coughs> it would be quite expensive uh, because you'd have the level of treatment would be quite high. But the important thing is that this cost, because the existing residences are covered and there is allocation available, this cost would be borne entirely by development. It wouldn't be cut, um, the existing ratepayers wouldn't be paying for this. It would be tied to new developments and, and a cost against new developments. So that, and and again, it, it that, although it would be, it might be a concern to developers, um, in the scale of the developments that, that we're talking about here, um, 20 or $30 million is not the end of the world. It's, it's a, or 10 to $20 million is not the end of the world in, in, in houses that are, are you know, gonna go probably 1,800 houses that are times $500,000 $500, a house, if not more. Um, so timing is important. Um, if you if the if the decision is to go with the Elmer collaboration because they already have a plant and they've been looking at expanding, um, you're probably looking at about a three to five year time frame. Um, if uh, the township goes on its own, then you're probably looking to go through the EA process and all the issues. You're probably looking at it around five years. So that would that would tie into the timelines for the entire project as well. So. In conclusions, um, and I'll go to conclusions and recommendations here, you know, to facilitate the plan development, the water project is really required, and it is potentially um, fund, uh, affordable under both the unfunded and unfunded scenarios. The funded scenario is obviously much more beneficial um, to everybody, so that should be the, the, uh, the go forward approach. Um, affordability is contingent on development because debt servicing becomes a concern if development is delayed. Um, upper tier funding would mitigate that risk. So it would, that the funding would allow, uh, get, reduce the water is, is a significant factor in this discussion. Um, you would have once, you'd have, like I said, you'd have about a year, year and a half, uh, once they start putting houses in before you'd start to run out of capacity and, and would have restricted development. So that if you want to open that up for full development, that would be important. Um, negotiations with uh, Elmer and the Water Board are important to secure the capacity um, to make sure there's the, the water is available to, to take, um, that the bulk water pricing, the cost you're paying per cubic meter of water is, is, is competitive, and to determine uh, which the best wastewater approach uh, for the township would be. So what our, what our recommendations based on the report are um, is enter into Elmer, enter into discussions with Elmer and the water board to confirm capacity availability of pricing structure. Um, enter in discussions with Elmer regarding the wastewater capacity and timing for upgrades to their facility. Um, best to be on board if they're starting that process, best to be uh, at the table at the start. Um, Start working towards building a case for upper tier funding through either the green infrastructure stream or identified uh, or identified uh, water problems due to groundwater quality in Springfield. If, if there's, if people are having concerns with the water quality, um, a study could be completed and that uh, a, a water quality issue would, you know, assist in, uh, in, in uh, 
meeting the criteria for uh, upper tier funding. Same thing with the green infrastructure stream is, is uh, the green infrastructure stream or the funding in general now is currently focused <coughs> primarily on um, low carbon uh, approaches. So um, development that includes you know, businesses local in Smelli would be, would be beneficial rather than a commuting approach. Um, so that's something to be considered as well. Um, start the, the Schedule B EA for the water supply project. It's not a long process, but it is a public process that needs to occur before uh, you can start building things. And, uh, and funding projects, are, uh, federal and provincial funding projects are also very, uh, they like to be shovel ready. So the, the, having things moved along uh, is, a, is a good way of, of helping the funding uh, move forward. Um, and then the next thing is, is to, to take away or to reduce that risk of economic, uh, begin the economic development efforts to engage the developers to minimize the risk of delay between when the water system is in place and when the development, when, they, when you can actually collect the development charge. And I think it's important, I, I, I will mention anecdotally, anecdotally I, uh, as part of this project, I, I did have a uh, discussion with a, developer, uh, a former colleague of mine that's currently in the development field to talk about the, 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 their sort of timeline from the point of where they purchase a property to the point of where they start, they are needing servicing to understand where it would fit in with the Malahide timelines. Um, and we weren't talking about specifically about Malahide, uh, but he was he was asked he wanted to know where it was because their their developers are constantly looking for new areas to develop because around the GTA and other places they're running out of uh, larger tracts of land to develop so um, that they uh, they are interested in uh, in these sort of projects so um, that's that's certainly a positive. So the timeline, um, and I should say this potential timeline. This is a feasibility study, so this is nothing is set in stone by far, but if you were to start the water supply class EA this fall, um, it could be so, so, uh, completed by next fall. Um, design and procurement could start once that is, is, uh, is completed with the water main tender uh, and ready for uh, winter 2024, pumping station, reservoir tender, fall 2024, start construction in the summer of 2024, and, um, and uh, probably have water flowing by uh, late 2025, early 2026. <coughs> um, so I hope um, that was helpful and then certainly open any questions or, or comments you may have. Okay, thank you, Jamie, for that uh, presentation. It gives us a lot to think about. Certainly, uh, there's a lot of unanswered questions. Uh, funding is probably the paramount. Um, it certainly is a, a lot more uh, um, palatable if we can get funding from provincial and federal. Um, and as well, we need to talk to our neighbors. So there's a lot we need to do. And I'm going to suggest to staff that we crunch the numbers, uh, keep this on the burner. But uh, because of our position that there's an election coming in November, I think the ultimate decision is going to be the next council. I, I, I would be really hesitant to, to do this for, for this council, but I do, do think we need to keep it on the burner and talk to our neighbors and crunch the numbers. So I'll open it up to questions for council uh, for Jamie. Jess, have you got a question? Yes, Mayor Manel. Uh, has there been any uh, consideration of when there might be uh... A public meeting on this topic. Uh, there are a lot of things here that need to be considered, as you said, and uh, so there's a lot of information that uh, need that we need feedback from the area in order to be able to continue. Adam, thank you, through your worship, uh, to answer that question. I think public consultation is certainly a crucial component to this, and it it would depend. So, as Jamie mentioned. One component could be through a class EA uh, process, but it doesn't have to be either. There, you, we could do an interim public consultation process before that. There's, uh, it could be done in a manner with uh, potentially the next term of council if they if they're having a, a visioning session or something like that about um, 
goals or objectives for the next term. But um, I'm, it, it, I think it's also something that we can detail in a follow up report if directed from council to do so. Okay. Max, have you got a question? Not a question, Mr. Mayor, just a comment. When the report came out and the council works came out on Tuesday, I started hearing about it. Not from my immediate household, yes, some there, but from other residents in the village. And there is a lot of concern, and I've yet to get one that would agree to it without further and more information as to what it's going to cost that individual property owner. How are we going to pay for it? You've got the water supply we're talking about possibly bringing in, which the gentleman on the review said that leads to sewage, gray water. Where's it going to go? We went through the hoops with the town of Elmer back in 98, 97. We had to pay for what the allotment was allowed to Malahide or Springfield. Plus, we had to give the town of Elmer an equal amount for free gratis to the town in regards to the residents of Springfield paying for it or out of the funding we got. But fortunately, with the sewage system and our good MPP of the day, Peter North and the NDP government, we got a 90% grant for the sewage system as did the village of Vienna at that time. It had never been heard of before. And I don't think it's ever been heard of since. And I don't if it ever will. Back in that day, it was somewhere in the 50s, possibly if you could muster a 60% grant from them. But there's a lot of things to look at here. And before we can really, we can look, we can proceed in my opinion, but we have to get the residents at a meeting to see what their thoughts are and explain the situation fully to them with qualified people. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Max, no question. Any other questions or comments? None, there is a recommendation. A mover and second, a report number CAO-2209 and the presentation of WT Infrastructure Solutions, Inc both entitled Feasibility Analysis of the Portable Water Distribution to the Village of Springfield be received. The final report of WT Infrastructure Solutions entitled Village of Springfield Feasibility Study, Study and Action Plan for Portable Water Distribution dated May 13th be received and that the administration be directed to proceed accordingly with the next steps of the final report. And the administration follow up with a report to council with regards to proceeding with a class EA process for serving the village of Springfield. In other words, we're turning this basically over to staff to keep it on the burner, but certainly there'll be no decisions as of tonight as far as where are we going in the, in the future. And as you stated, Max, that part and parcel of that will be have a public meeting once we know what exact, exactly what the costs are going to be for individuals, because no one can make a decision with you know, you could be funding zero, you could be funding 80%. So that, that is a real key. Okay. Move by Moore, second by Cerna. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you, Jamie. Maybe he's not here. I guess not. So next we have correspondence and there is oh we have community outside boards. Uh, we have two from the community outside boards. Uh, Long point. Uh, any questions or comments on that one? We were in second to receive and file then. Winder Linsky on favor. In correspondence, we have 13 items. Anyone wish to make comment or endorsement? No burning issues. Move in second to receive and file, please. Jair and Lewis, all in favor?
Other business? Mark? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I guess a little over a year ago, I, I brought the attention to Lake County Council to be looking at the intersection of 52 and 73. Mm -hmm. I don't know where that's at. Um, in the meantime, we've had another fatality. We've had one every year for the last two years. I know there was talk of a study, but bodies are piling up. That has had so many crashes out there. I don't think you can redesign it anymore to work other than a roundabout because it's been redesigned, what, three or four times already. So I just hope they're on the move to do that. It's too bad we could be doing it in part and parcel with the new road construction, but um, I don't know. There's something definitely wrong because they're just, they're sad accidents and they keep piling up. So we need to be looking at that. Okay. Thanks for those comments. Anything else for other business? Dominic? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to um, point out that it's been one year since we've had a new CAO. So I wanted to congratulate Adam on the first year anniversary tomorrow. And um, time flies because it's quick to forget that at this time last year, we had to, uh, we didn't have a fire chief. Uh, we had the resignation of the treasurer and then we had the imminent parental leave. So a lot of challenges. And um, I look at where we are today. Um, I think you did pretty good. So, so thank you. And uh, congratulations. Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, I have one thing to bring up under other business. And, and as you know, uh, the Port Bruce Provincial Park has been a bit of a uh, sore in my thigh for a number of years and uh we've getting pushback from from uh mnr about cleaning up the beach for 12 years and i've took it upon myself to in fact we had to go over the regional manager to the head manager to get some agreement on one-third recreational and two-thirds natural and they're still stuck on that and i, I accept that uh, but when we went to clean up the beach this year, they said, no, we don't want to clean up anything at all because uh, we don't want to take any chances that it's going to erode the beach. So um, I think in the past, I've just taken upon myself to get uh, staff to go down there with a loader and some volunteers and picked up the, the driftwood and the tires and the dead deer and everything else that was in the, in the beach. But uh, this year we see uh, necessary to get endorsement from all of council to go ahead. And so there's a resolution that I'm gonna put forward and hopefully I can get support that uh, staff be directed to request Parks Ontario to allow the cleaning and disposal of driftwood, which is washed up upon Port Bruce Provincial Park, Southern Imperial Road. So if I can get support on this, then we'll hopefully we'll move forward and, and get this thing cleaned up before the kids get out of school and want to go down to the beach. So moved by Widner. Secondary by Serna, all in favor, carried. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, the, 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 uh, our work crews from the township did an excellent job on cleaning up the source. Of, it's kind of like a municipal, but there's some no man's land in there that is sort of, uh, we're not sure exactly who the ownership is because the taxes haven't been paid for about 120 years, but we've left it that way. And and I think they spent about four days down there did they not, not cleaning up. And it, it's I've got a lot of good comments on how good that looks. So hopefully we can do the same thing in the provincial park. Uh, anything other other business before we go to bylaws? Mover and seconder bylaw number 22-40 being a bylaw to authorize the execution and mending an agreement with the Ontario Clean Water Agency for the provision and operation and maintenance schedule for the water facilities be given a first, second, third reading, properly signed and sealed. Linsky and Lewis, all in favor? Here. And we were in second or bylaw number 22-41 being a bylaw to authorize the execution of amending agreement with Ontario Clean Water Agency for the provision of operations and maintenance schedule for the Malahide Wastewater Collection System be given a first, second, third reading and proper sign and seal. Chair, Widner, all in favor?
Move in second of bylaw number 22-18, being bylaw to incorporate various parcels into a road system be given a first, second, third reading and properly signed and sealed. Serta, Lewis, on favor. And anything else before we move into close? None. We were in second our council moving to closed session at 916. Pursuant to section 239-2 uh, of the Municipal Act as amended to discuss the following. Labor relations or employee negotiation matter relating to staff recruitment matter relating to the development services department. Moore and, and Widner on paper. Here you go. <clears throat> Anybody <clears throat> needs a quick break before we go into Closed. That during the closed session, council provided direction to municipal staff regarding labor relations or employee negotiation relating to a staff recruitment matter relating to development services, and there is nothing further to report. So I need a mover and second or bylaw number 22-49 being confirmatory bylaw be given a first, second, third reading properly signed and sealed. Serna and Lewis, all in favor, opposed, carry. And finally, council adjourn at 10-12. Vinsky and Widner, all in favor, carry. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>